topics today. I would like that all the questions to me will come right away because I have to leave it around 2.30. So I won't be here till the end of the meeting. So if you have questions, put them in the chat now or you know, raise your hand and we'll we'll have you say say the questions. Okay, so two specific questions. Uh, one is just a random thing I found, which I find it kind of cool. So I'll start with that. Um, COVID often, in the past at least, was creating a lot of loss of taste and smell. And there was really no effective treatment for it until recently. And the, the, the typical treatment was something called sensitization therapy, which um, like I have a whole handout. If anybody's interested, let me know, I'll email it to you. You basically take uh, three strong smells, something like a lavender, I think was, uh, there was something sweet, something, um, uh, well, three different smells, something soothing. And then I think the third was a spicy smell. I can't remember what the, I just remember lavender, there were two others. And so, and you, uh, every couple hours, you take a deep sniff of each and you rotate. And so the idea was that sort of forces the system to, uh, it's a neurostimulation in essence. Um, and recently, and apparently there's a drug in Japan that is not approved in America, which has been, there's a conversation about it getting it approved. And I have to read the name of it because I don't remember it. Encitralivir. It's basically similar medication to the uh, malnuprevir, but it's slightly different. And, and it actually significantly improves restoration of taste and smell. And they already use it as it was approved in Japan and they use it for the specific indication. Will it come to US? We'll see, but it's kind of a good news. I think that uh, there are still some patients who've had uh, loss of smell and taste from the original uh, COVID back a few years ago where they still have the issue. And interestingly, in the last six months, I've seen at least two cases of a loss of uh, smell again with the newest variants. Uh, both were very transient. They lasted for about a month, uh, but they were there. So it, it's not the issue that fully went away. So I think having some possible future treatment options would be rather important. Uh, second point is, I think a lot of you ask about Novavax. Is it better? What's the story there, right? So I had to do a little bit of digging. Um, turns out that, that the consensus is basically doesn't matter. Just take whatever shot you want, whether it's Pfizer, Moderna, or Novavax. But there are some differences. So the Novavax is the only one that's uh, currently available as a booster that is not a mRNA vaccine, right? So it's an old style protein based. Um, so if you, for whatever reason, whether you believe in microchipping like my mother-in-law or you're more normal human being and you believe that there may be some autoimmunity associated with this and you're not gonna take it, it's fine. But so you have that option of having an old style vaccine. Um, and turns out there's one little small advantage of Novavax and it seems to last a little bit longer. So this is about a four to eight weeks uh, further efficacy compared to the, especially Pfizer with, I've talked a little bit, in fact, I even did this whole review of an article I don't think it's relevant now because it was for the past vaccine, not for the current that basically was showing some differences in length of efficacy for Moderna versus Pfizer. But it looks like Novavax is winning a little bit. And, and it's a very small difference. So frankly, does it really matter? I don't think so, but you know, it, it's this is the data. And this is a small study that particularly pointed that out. It's a relatively recent study. Uh, the other thing is that the same study basically also showed that um, it doesn't really indeed matter what crossover you're doing. Um, there was a study which we reviewed actually some maybe about a year ago that showed that when you're crossing over Moderna to Pfizer or the reverse that you sort of have a better boosting and their suggestion was with Novavax it'll be even so. No. So there's no real conclusive evidence. There's really no reason to believe that's the case. So I'm still, my position is simple. Don't make it too difficult. Whatever is there, get it. And don't break your brain over it. Now, if you're, again, in one of those categories, whether microchipping, you believe in that or something else, fine. Get the Novavax is perfectly fine. I don't know how prevalent the availability of Novavax is. That would be an interesting question. Does anybody have a Novavax? 
I'm just curious. Because it's not something that I have seen a lot of my patients getting. And I'm not sure why that is. I'm actually thinking it's just this supply and demand issue more than anything. I think a lot of places like CVS and others, they're just getting stuck with Pfizer and Moderna. I don't think there's any other particular reason. That 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 I, I can't speak for that number. So okay, so all right, let's see if there's questions. Uh, people I know are being told that to get RSV vaccine only if they have spent around children. Uh, I mean, okay, I think there's a re there is a logic in this because kids tend to get more RSV, but but we're talking about somewhat of a different issue here. The RSV generally in the past um, was infecting mostly kids. Uh, in the last few years, there's been a jump. So whether or not um, it sort of all comes from kids, absolutely not. You can easily get it from another adult. And so with that logic, uh, it, uh, no, right? But if you are hanging out with a lot of grandkids, for example, and they're going daycare and, and they're bringing everything back, which everybody knows that's what happens. Well, that's different, right? So you may opt indeed to be more aggressive because you may have a much higher risk of getting it, not because you're not hanging out with adults, but because the grandkids go to the daycare. So that that's really, you need to assess, try to assess the individual risk. I'm personally a bit more cautious about RSV and I'm not exactly sure why, but I don't like when new vaccines are starting getting promoted without first a bit more mortality data, uh, meaning, it's not practical to simply say, okay, you get the RS uh, vaccine, you no longer get RSV and that's it. It would be true if we'd know that, that uh, each year would have a roughly same amount of our RSV happening and we know mortality of it. The problem with RSV is, and I think I've explained that before, is that it fluctuates. In contrast to flu, which the, every year it's sort of roughly the same, RSV can widely um, differ. And it actually usually waxes and wanes. So the it's rarely you have two bad years one after another. It could theoretically happen, but it's usually not. So last year was bad. There's a good chance that this year is not going to be. So that's why my priority is get everybody flu and COVID shots. And, and, and I don't push RSV unless um, there's one particular exception, which is asthma and COPD patients. Even if you're 65, I'd likely to say, please get it just because those are the patients who tend to have more severe cases of RSV when, when they do occur. All right, I saw a hand pop up and then it disappeared. I don't know if somebody actually meant that or not, but uh, the floor is open. Two more questions. All right, silent group today, that's fine. All right, Jennifer. Unmute yourself, dear. Yeah, there, there, there was a. I saw a study about something about serotonin in long COVID. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all. all right. I didn't want to talk about this because I prepared. Okay, something. never mind. No, 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 no. Let me mention this, and we'll talk about this next week because actually it's an important study. So it's a study that came out comes out of the University of Pennsylvania. It's kind of all over the news. It's like everywhere you look at. Uh, I don't, I didn't want to shortcut it. In short, the study says the following. We measured serotonin. It's low. Let's give everybody antidepressants. Like literally, I'm not kidding. That's exactly how the study is formatted. Um, and the fact that they measured serotonin is problematic. The fact that they made the statement that the serotonin low cause of long COVID is very problematic. It's simply a marker of inflammatory response. We know that. So I'll be discussing this study because I'm sure you're all going to have gazillion questions about it. And if you have seen it in the news and you're like, oh, my God, wow, should I be taking on something to boost my serotonin now so I don't have long COVID? We'll cover that, I promise. Uh, we've spent two hours this week in our long COVID group discussing this study because obviously you can imagine that patients who already have long COVID are way more concerned about this study than uh, and it's a it's a decent study. There's no problem with the study itself. It's a very good study. Uh, conclusions are a little iffy. It's funny. Conclusions are basically based on one simple reality. In the Western model, when you talk about particular abnormality, there's going to be a medical solution. 
we all in integrative medicine know that there's literally dozens, if not hundred ways of boosting serotonin, anywhere from lifestyle like exercise to taking particular foods, uh, looking at some uh, supplements that tend to be cofactors for making serotonin. So it's a much more complex topic than just simply saying, yeah, let's just next trial would be, let's give everybody Prozac and see what happens. Um, we actually kind of know what's going to happen when we do that, but we're going to hold that thought until next week. Thanks. Thanks actually for saying that because I wasn't going to bring this up at all. All right. Well, I, I, unless if there's no other questions, maybe we should just move to Sally because it's 2.16 and I think that's a perfect time. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. I'm gonna spotlight Sally for you. Okay. okay. Hello. Um, I can see a few of you. So I am Dr. Sally Novak. I'm a doctor of oriental medicine and a licensed clinical social worker with over 20 years of experience. Uh, most of my experience was in trauma treatment and working with substance use disorders in the active duty military population. Um, I have a small Chinese medicine practice in Ellicott City, Maryland. And I'm on the staff at the uh, GW Center for Integrative Medicine. I am their integrative psychotherapist, and I'm also on their RECODE team. I am very excited about some of the developments I see in the mental health field these days, um, particularly the renaissance of psychedelic-assisted therapies. Uh, there's growing interest in somatic modalities. Um, one of my favorite modalities, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And we see more and more discussions about spiritual assessment and practice. I think they are an answer to a need for more spiritually informed care, a sign of increasing desire and willingness to turn inward and seek one's own truth in a never ending barrage of messages from outside. I'm particularly excited about new discussions around altered states of consciousness. And I'm gonna pause because I want you to think about how you respond internally if any attitudes come up for you around those words. Um, for me, um, having worked in the substance use field for a long time, I do have a reaction. Um, but I do think that so much of the work I have done, not even in the realm of psychedelics, has been about helping people break free of their general patterns of thinking and behaving. Milton Erickson, who was a renowned hypnotherapist, did this brilliantly in his work with clients, not only helping them achieve a trance state, but then using language techniques to throw them off balance um, so that they could access experiences through a different lens. And so much trauma and suffering in the world has a contracting impact on our awareness, our consciousness. And so I think there's something beautiful about this idea of opening and becoming more expansive in our, in our awareness. Of course, other cultures, including indigenous tribes of the United States and ancient Chinese culture, have long honored the relationship of body and spirit and the vital importance, importance of spiritual healing. And while I could argue that modern times are a source of much suffering through our separation from each other, and the inundation of information that we all deal with on a daily basis. Um, I also think, however, the amount of multicultural conversation and scholarship that we have have contributed to expansions of our understanding and our approaches to healing. I remember my first psychotherapy experience. I was 13 years old. I had lost my younger brother and sister in a car accident several years before. And my parents were, and this is an understatement, struggling to cope. No one thought that I had an issue, that I was struggling until I stopped eating. Dr. Sheehan, I still remember his name and that's saying something, asked me in our first meeting to draw a picture of God. Now, I actually think this was an enlightened intervention, but at the time I was a pre precocious preteen 
who had been parenting herself and oftentimes her parents for several years. And he was asking me to draw with crayons. I did the exercise, drew what I thought would please him, and I never went back. Reflecting on the experience now, I think that had Dr. S been versed in assessment of the spirit, had he tried to maybe a little bit more, a little more effective at connecting with me, teenagers are hard, I get it. Had he been more curious and maybe asked about my experience of the exercise, he might have helped me uncover what it took me far longer in reality to, to understand. It was right there. I was a pissed off young lady. Working for the DOD, I often railed against the overemphasis on protocols. I sometimes felt like service members were treated in assembly line fashion with a step-by-step, session-by-session instruction manual for treatments. I excel at breaking rules and I did so often in the service of the unique and uniquely whole service member sitting in the seat next to me. I would ask questions of myself. Were they really present with me? How did they identify and relate to themselves? What brilliant defenses did they have in place? I will never forget the surly Sergeant Major who came to life as he began to express childhood traumas using art. We cannot take the individual out of the question, out of the equation. And Chinese medicine recognizes this. In Chinese medicine, part of the initial evaluation involves assessing the shin. Shin means, well, it roughly translate, it translates as spirit. And one can think of it as the light within, the sparkle in the eyes. Shin encapsulates our presence soul, and consciousness. It helps us connect with the outside world, and it is what, in Chinese theory, makes us truly human. In fact, and I'm not a Chinese language scholar, so if I mispronounce things, please forgive me. In fact, in Chinese, Shin is one of the three ways to express the concept of I, or of self. It allows us to be conscious of ourselves, it gives us our sense of self and identity. It is said to alter our curriculum in this life. I love that part. Um, it's the spirit that allows us to feel and assess emotions. It's responsible for memory, intelligence, wisdom, and the formation of ideas. And of course, it allows us to relate to others. So clearly, clearly an important part of overall, our overall well-being. So how do Chinese medical practitioners and how do I as an integrative psych psychotherapist assess the shin? Well, shin is contained in the heart and in health, it radiates upward through the eyes. So we notice it in a person's ability to make eye contact and maintain eye contact and the luster of their eyes and the clarity. Have you ever been interacting with someone when you looked in their eyes and you got the sense that maybe they were somewhere else? I mean, I'm still a young practitioner, but the longer I practice energy work, the more attuned I am to shin disturbances. I walked into a restaurant a few weeks ago and suddenly felt very nauseated and uneasy. I commented on it to my husband and he asked, is your Chinese medicine radar going off? Sure enough, the waitress arrived and her eyes were like two dark pools. It's spooky season, so I'll share that we call it possession, not in the exorcist sense of the word, uh, though it can be scary, um, but more like something other than the shin is taking up residence in the person's heart. Um, sometimes people will speak to it in conversation when they say things like, I just feel like I'm not in control. I feel like someone else is driving the bus of my life. Um, so. In his work, I'm going to mention um, my favorite modern Chinese med medical scholar named Heiner Freuhoff. Um, in his work, all disease comes from the heart, the pivotal role of the emotions in classical Chinese medicine. Um, he says, 
To the creators of Chinese medicine, being human meant to be endowed with a heart and the resultant potential to sense, connect to, and ritually celebrate the higher dimensions regarded as the source of all life. The ancient symbolic representation of the heart is a ding. And again, I may be mispronouncing this, um, but it was an earthen ceremonial container. They were frequently put in the center of villages and they would store spirits there or they would use them for offerings. <clears throat> so it's an earthen container. And it's supposed to be, the heart itself is supposed to be an empty vessel. So the concept is that we are called to have an empty heart because the shin or spirit has to be invited home. And there has to be sufficient space for it to take up residence. So I actually have a picture of the Chinese character. My computer has decided not to cooperate with me. So I had to print it out so you guys can see this. So this is the character for the heart. And it actually, uh, my teachers would say, resembles a nest. And there's also a sense of movement. So it's like the empty nest and the spirit is moving through. Um, and emotions are, you know, emotions are supposed to move through and not to get stuck. But because we're human and because we are inundated with information, um, we oftentimes collect things in our ding um, that prevent the, the, the shin from taking residence. So I would ask you to consider your own heart. Is your vessel free for your spirit to inhabit? Or are you storing expectations, obsessions, base desires, first world problems? In a 2016 book entitled Psycho-Emotional Pain and the Eight Extraordinary Vessels, um, Pharrell says, the body is driven by survival so that function can continue. The spirit, however, knows that survival may be important, but is not enough. The spirit knows that life can have meaning and purpose. The spirit can and will create an environment where a tremendous amount of physical or emotional suffering can occur so that we will let go of our resistance and embrace the lessons we are here to learn. It's an amazing time to be alive. This Friday, October 20th, 2023, as Diane Connolly, who founded one of the founders of Thai Sophia used to say, there never has been, never will be another Friday, October 20th, 2023. We are in fall, a season for reflection and letting go. Perhaps today we begin our journey of self-cultivation, of inventorying the contents of our heart. We may resolve to make space for ourselves and seek whatever support or guidance we need along the way. If people are interested in learning more about the Shin, um, two recommendations I have would be Reiner, Heiner Freuhoff's um, All Disease Comes from the Heart. It's a little bit esoteric, but not too bad. Um, the pivotal role of the emotions in classical Chinese medicine. Um, I would also recommend Diane Connolly's book, All Sickness is Homesickness. It's one of my favorites. Um, for people who are interested in reaching out to me for more questions or information, um, again, you can find me at CIM's website. Um, and my professional email address, which I'll put in the chat, is snovak for Sally Novak at lamplighterwellness.com. Lamplighter Wellness is the name of my business. And it comes from the idea that I tell my clients, you are not broken. I'm not here to fix you. I'm just here to help you turn the light on. I thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and I'd like to take a moment of silence for all those suffering in conflict and wars around the world and for all those who are suffering. Thank you.
Thank you, Sally, so, so much. Um, and you're right on time. It's 2.30. Well, thank you, thank you. Okay, and then for our mindfulness part. Um, let's move right in. Um, hi. Hi. Thank Hi, you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Because Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Allison Glucksman. I have been teaching yoga for 12 years now. I started working more in health promotion. I studied health promotion at American University, and I have the last few years been teaching in the health studies department and undergraduate class in yoga, as well as a local studio here. That's how I came to know Lee. Um, and I am back in school studying to get a master's of science in yoga therapy at MUIH. So I'm not yet a registered yoga therapist, but working towards it. And one thing I wanted to call your attention to before we started the activity is that we are seeking um, clients for our student clinic and for as part of our um, practical application of our program, we are required to see clients. So if any of you are interested at all, or simply interested in what the process is and what yoga therapy is, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you um, after this. But if you're interested, we are looking for clients. And um, we can talk more about that as well. My, my email is in the chat. So I'm going to move back because I think most of you are seated on a chair and I wanted to mimic that. But if you are on a mat, um, that's okay too. We'll have an opportunity to sit and move and breathe and then potentially lie down if you have space. But seat, uh, remaining seated is also okay. So if you are seated and your feet aren't quite touching the ground, if you have blocks or books underneath you, that might be helpful for your for your posture. Just a suggestion if you're going to remain seated for um, the duration of the, of the exercise. So we're going to start with some breathing, taking your time to get comfortable in your seat, letting the eyes softly close or look down the cheeks. We'll turn our awareness inward and just notice how you're feeling how the movement of the breath feels in the body. Noticing in particular if the breath feels shallow or stuck or easy and fluid. If it feels like it's more in the chest or the belly, taking inventory before we try to smooth it out or change it in any way. And then if you're comfortable, let the hands rest at the lower belly. And start to feel a, a little bit more movement, a little bit more intentional movement of the belly with your breath in. So let the, let the belly initiate the inhalation and then feel the ribs and chest expand. And then feel a softening as you breathe in and out through the nose. Connecting to a full breath in, movement in the belly, the ribs, and the chest. And then stretch out that slow exhalation. Trying to make the exhalation a little bit longer than the inhalation helps to target the parasympathetic nervous system, encourages that switch from activation and fight or flight to rest and digest and self-care. Continue a few more rounds of breath, feeling the belly move, the ribs expand, and then a slow, deep breath out. One more simple breath. And then let the hands rest over the thighs. 
and try to maintain that easy, steady breath as we start to curl the toes in. If you have shoes on and you want to slide them off, you can, but you can also curl the toes in your shoes too. So take a moment and curl the toes in, and activate the feet, and then exhale, spread the toes out and stretch. And then again, curl the toes in and spread them out. And then point the toes by lifting the heels and then dropping the heels and flexing the feet. One more like that. Point the toes, lift the heels. Drop the heels, flex the feet. Ground through the right foot and then circle the left ankle in one direction and then the other. And let that foot come down. And then we'll do the other side, circle the other side in one direction. And then the other. So joint rotations are great to warm up, but they're also, when you can't go anywhere, a nice way to get some energy in the body. We'll lift, the, lift one foot high up off the ground, and then lower, and then the other side, and lower. And this time we'll lift the first side, and we'll externally rotate the thigh so it angles outward. And then internally rotate, go the other way. Once more to external. And then in. And then place that foot down. Lift the other side. Rotate the thigh out. And in. Once more out. And in. Nice. Place that foot down. Letting the arms now rest by your side or on the outside of your chair. It'll take a side bend to, the, to one side. Lengthening the side body. And come up through center. Lengthen the other direction. And then come back up. And then we'll rotate. So bring right hand to left leg. Slide the left fingers behind you. Thinking about that long breath in to sit up a little taller. And then hold the space on your breath out. And then come back through center. And we'll switch the other way. Left hand to right thigh. Right fingers behind you. Nice. Come back to center. And this time we'll send the arms out in front of us, right? So really spread out through the hands and then curl the fingers in. Exhale. Inhale, spread open through the hands. Exhale, curl them in. And then inhale, open the hands, flex the wrist. A little switch when you exhale, flex, turn the fingers, point them down. Inhale, turn the fingers up. Exhale, point them down. One more time, we're going to point them up. And then as you point them down, bend the elbows out to the side, sort of like making little kind of chicken wings. And then turn the fingers up and pull the hands apart. And then bring the elbows back out to the side. Straighten the hands, flex the wrist. Turn the wrist uh, fingers down. Bend the elbows to the side. Spin the fingers up, the elbows down, and then kind of pull towards the thumbs. Nice, bring it back, straighten the arms, flex, so um, turn the fingers up. Now we're going to take the right hand, slide it behind your low back, 
and put the left hand on your thigh and release the left ear to the left shoulder. Nice, breathing into that side of the neck. Still maintaining the gaze inward, the focus on the breath. And then lift the head slowly back up. Stretch both arms out in front of you, flex the wrists. And then slide the opposite hand behind your back. Right hand to your thigh, right ear toward shoulder. And as you bring the head back up, slowly extend both arms, reach them forward, and then let them come down by your uh, lap, hands to lap. Inhale, take the shoulders up to the ears. Exhale, slide them back and down. Two more shoulder rolls. Inhale, take it up. Exhale, back. One more time. Slide it back. And then just a couple scrunches of the face, right? So kind of scrunch the eyes, open the jaw, make an, an affected smile, and then soften around the face. Get active in the face, shrug and kind of turn the muscles on around the eyes and the face, cheeks, temple, and then relax. One more time. And relax. <clears throat> I'm going to lead you from here into a, a short meditation. So you could remain seated if you're comfortable, or you could lie down if you have a couch or a mat nearby and you wanted to lay down instead of remaining seated. If you have a blanket, feel free to get as comfortable as you can. <clears throat> And then whether you're seated or laying down, explore if you can close your eyes or maybe just soften the gaze easily out in front of you or down at your lap. And the following is a yoga nidra meditation for um, deep relaxation and feeling grounded. It's meant to be done laying down, but we can improvise today and be seated as well. Invite stillness into your body. Be aware of the space your body is occupying. Imagine that you're drawing a circle of protection around your whole body. This circle can be made of anything you wish. Fire, light, your favorite flowers, fresh soil, limbs of trees, or a wall of clay. Whatever calls to you, establish the circle of protection around yourself. See and feel yourself inside the circle. As you become more still, begin to feel the breath as it enters your nostrils. Feel it travel into your lungs where it dissolves. Then follow its path all the way to somewhere outside of your body where it dissolves again. You are not controlling the breath. You're merely watching it move in and out of your body. Feel your navel rise and fall as you breathe in and breathe out. Feel yourself supported in your chair or lying on, on the earth. 
Slowly scan through your body and become aware of how you're holding it. You may recall the body parts that felt constricted during our earlier body awareness exercise. Feel free to let your body adjust for one more layer of comfort. Let your awareness move towards sound. Noticing all the sounds around you without judgment. Allow your awareness to move from sound to sound to sound. Let all the sounds be there. You are on the inside of your circle. The sounds are on its circumference. For this meditation, we will set an intention or sankalpa. I honor and acknowledge my body as a sacred vessel that houses my inner light. I invite deep rest into every cell of my being. I trust that I deserve to be supported, nurtured, and held unconditionally. I know the earth can hold me. Notice the parts of your body that are touching the floor. Begin at your feet and scan upward. Feel your hands, your heels touching the floor and silently repeat the mantra, Lum. Feel the next point where your body contacts the floor or your chair and repeat, Lum. Connect and continue all the way until you get to the top of your head. Calves and the floor, lum. Back of your thighs, lum. Parts of your spine, lum. Shoulder blades, lum. Back of your head, Lum. Feel all of these body parts becoming heavier as you repeat the mantra, Lum. Notice your body breathing. As it receives an inhalation, sense the earth rising up to hold and cradle you. It's as though the involuntary act of inhaling is calling the earth toward you. As your body exhales, ask it to surrender into the earth. Every in-breath invites the earth to support you even more. Every outbreath is a trusting acceptance that you deserve to be held. Begin with the number 27 and begin to count backward. Inhale 27, exhale 27. Inhale 26. Exhale, 26. Inhale, 25. Exhale, 25. Inhale, 24. Exhale, 24. Continue counting, following your own breath, all the way until you reach zero.
Each time you exhale, a layer of constriction and tension is released from your body and your mind. By the time you get to zero, the body and mind are completely free. Once you get to zero, feel the earth holding you unconditionally. Feel your body and the earth breathing as one. Now slowly begin to transition out of the practice. Noticing everything during this transition. And welcome yourself back. Notice the breath. Notice your body. Notice the earth beneath you and begin to deepen your breath. Remembering our intention for today and always, I honor and acknowledge my body as a sacred vessel that houses my inner light. I invite deep breaths into every cell of my being. I trust that I deserve to be supported, nurtured and held unconditionally. I know the earth can hold me. As the breath deepens, small movements in the body, the fingers and toes might start to feel welcome. If you are lying down, you're welcome to stay as you are, or you could take your time and sit up. And then whether you're sitting or remaining reclined, let your hands rest over your belly again or, or by your sides and take a couple of deep breaths, feeling the belly move as you breathe in. and take a deep breath out. And we'll do that three more times. Full breath in, long breath out. Breathe in, and let it go slowly. Once more, fill yourself up and let it go. Thank you so much for join, inviting me and, and, jo and joining with me for that meditation and some joint moving and breath. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to wish everyone a happy Friday, have a wonderful weekend, and um, be blessed. Bye.